Today's hearing brought up two familiar names, longtime Trump advisor Roger Stone and Trump lawyer John Eastman. As Cassidy Hutchinson testified, her former boss, Mark Meadows, planned to attend that infamous January 5th war room meeting at the Willard Hotel with Eastman, Rudy Giuliani, and others. Hutchinson said she told Meadows that going was not a smart idea, so he opted to dial in instead. Now, these blockbuster hearings seem like a wild serial tale using fake electors and even violence to hand a presidential election to the loser. Maybe that's because you don't fully remember the 2000 election. During last week's hearing, the committee played this clip of Eastman addressing Georgia Republicans a month after the 2020 election. You could also do what the Florida legislature was prepared to do, which is to adopt a slate of electors yourself. I don't think it's just your authority to do that, but quite frankly, I think you have a duty to do that what the Florida legislature was prepared to do. Now, inserting Florida into the mix in this most recent presidential election just seemed odd to me and kind of like a throwaway. I mean, Trump won that state, right? But it is a reminder of how some of the same characters from the 2000 election aftermath are back big time. Namely, Eastman and Stone, who effectively laid the groundwork for an almost identical scheme in Florida back in 2000, including the false claims of voter fraud. Stone used those claims to mass hundreds of operatives who descended on Miami-Dade County, staging the so-called Brooks Brothers Riot, demanding an end to the statewide recount on George W. Bush's behalf. Stone orchestrated that threatening scene as a distraction to the legitimate statewide recount. A few days after that disturbance, Florida lawmakers held a hearing to discuss maybe appointing their own Bush electors, no matter how the count went, with testimony from none other than John Eastman. Here... The power delegated to you by Article 2, Section 1 is a plenary power. It knows no other appeal. I think it's important to keep that in mind as we go through these very technical statutory provisions. And we cannot view those congressional statutes as altering your plenary power that you have directly by the Constitution of the United States. Now, that, that plenary power stuff, that should sound familiar, given what former Vice President Mike Pence's counsel, Greg Jacob, and Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers testified that Eastman said to them about two key aspects of his scheme. You and I will mutually understand that the underlying legal theory of plenary vice presidential authority is what you have to have to get there. We would decertify the electors. And that that because we had plenary authority to do so. Back with me are Charles Coleman, Jr., Betsy Woodruff, Swan and Glenn Kirshner. And Charles, I'll start with you on this. I mean, when I heard that little snippet where he said what the Florida electors were prepared to do, it kind of stuck in my head because I, you know, still have trauma over the 2000 election and remember this whole argument that there was a case being made to the Florida legislature, which is Republican control, that they should just put in their own electors. And I did not remember until looking until someone, I think, put it out on social media that it was John Eastman who was making that exact same argument. What do you make of just the idea, the theoretical idea that Eastman updated his plan for Trump? Well, Joy, we've seen this movie before, and we know how it ends. This is out of straight out of the Eastman playbook. He did it in Florida, and he was prepared to do it again. The only thing that stopped this from taking place in Florida in 2000 was the fact that the Supreme Court got involved, and they made a decision which stopped the process. Otherwise, we would have been looking at the Florida legislature doing exactly what we saw the, the delegates attempt to do in this particular situation around January 6th, which would have been a nightmare. But there's a bigger takeaway that I need viewers to understand, Joy. And that bigger takeaway is when we dismiss these sort of fringe theories of people being kooks and being wackos and having very, very ridiculous and absurd takes on what it is that our government should be and is designed to do, it's not like they go away. They stay there and they grow and they fester. And we have not eliminated them by delegitimizing them. We don't just have to delegitimize them. We have to actually call them out. Ignoring them does not make them disappear. And I think that Eastman and what we're seeing here is a classic example of that. He did not go away. He just went back into his hole until it was a time that was profitable for him to come out, a time such as this. And now we have to deal with that on a bigger scale. 
So when we get into these conversations about these fringe theories, what seems to be absurd, they'll never work, they'll never be a big deal. We have to be very mindful that fringe theories ultimately become false equivalencies that then become theories that people latch onto, that then become problems that January 6th exemplifies. So we have to be mindful of how that happens. Absolutely. And Betsy, I mean, I think about the people who were at this this Willard, this infamous Willard Hotel meeting. I mean, it's it's Steve Bannon, the guy who said, you know, all hell is going to break loose on January 6th. It is John Eastman. It's Rudy Giuliani and his buddy Bernard Carrick, who got pardoned for crimes. Boris Epstein, Trump's, um, you know, sort of uh, acolyte and other people, even Christina Bob from OAN. I mean, they, it's this group. But Roger Stone and Michael Flynn were also involved in these efforts, these same characters kind of coming back to it, what does feel like trying to rerun that old playbook. Certainly. And the cast of characters that materialized at the Willard is a really interesting mix, both of people who uh, certainly had notable roles in historic episodes in the past, as this, this video of Eastman I had not seen before highlights, but also people who very much are still part of Trump's inner circle. Boris Epstein, one of the folks who was at the Willard Hotel, works closely with former President Trump. He's not somebody who's been you know, marginalized or diminished whatsoever in the wake of January 6th. Rather, he plays an important role in President Trump's current, former President Trump's current circle of advisors. We would expect that if Trump does run again in 2024, Boris Epstein would very much be in the trenches with him, at least based on everything that I know right now. Bernie Carrick, of course, is also somebody whose testimony, I think, has flown under the radar, but who's brought really interesting information to the committee, particularly, as I reported a while back, testifying to the committee about the origins of that draft executive order that made its way into the White House that would have had Trump send the military to seize voting machines. That would have been just there aren't enough adjectives to describe what that would have been. It would have been absolutely astonishing. It's something that Bernie Carrick was able to really share detailed information about with the select committee. This is what the folks at the Willard Hotel were involved in. This is what they knew about. The fact that the White House chief of staff, according to his top deputy at the time, wanted to go there and then ultimately settled just for calling in tells you that there was more of a White House connection to this particular coterie of folks that we'd previously known. Yeah, and, and you know, Glenn, and Eastman himself is this interesting character that is at the center of this, the sort of intellectualization of this coup, right? Creating sort of the, the memo for it. He's taken, he's gotten the interest of the FBI. Um, there's video here that was played um, on Tucker Carlson's show last night as um, he was, had his phone seized and he was very upset and was asking for the warrant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to play you, there he is saying, give me the warrant, show me the warrant. He gets his phone taken. This is what he then said on Fox News about that seizure. There's no indication of, uh, of, of any crime that this is connected to. Um, that's apparently in an, attach, in an affidavit, but the affidavit wasn't attached to the warrant. The Fourth Amendment's very clear here. Uh, when they search and seize your property, they have to give a particular description of the things to be seized. I'm an attorney. It's access to all my privileged communications with nearly 100 different clients. The very reason we have the Fourth Amendment is to prevent that kind of abuse. And yet that's what they're doing here. Well, if they arrested him and didn't read his Miranda rights, according to the Supreme Court, he couldn't sue them. So that's uh, thanks to his Supreme Court. But, I mean, is he right about that? I mean, doesn't there have to be a warrant? To, they don't just seize your phone just because they feel like it. I mean, it, it, can, he, can it possibly be that there's no crime attached? Glenn. No, John Eastman can huff and puff all he wants, but a federal judge reviewed an affidavit in support of an application for a search warrant for John Eastman's phone, and that judge concluded that there was probable cause, that there was crime right now to be found in John Eastman's phone. And